Professor Simon Levay autopsied human brains of homosexuals and heterosexuals. In the 1990s, he made a discovery that hit the headlines. In fact, I was director of a vision research laboratory at the Salk Institute. In the late 80s, my then partner, whose name was Richard, he fell ill with AIDS and he died in 1990. And I felt that I wanted to do some research that was more connected to my own identity as a gay man, and this seemed a natural subject to investigate. What I discovered was that there is indeed a difference in the structure of the brains of gay men and straight men. And this structural difference is in a part of the brain called the hypothalamus that has a lot to do with regulating our sexual behavior and sexual feelings. In this part of the brain, there is a group of cells which typically is larger in males than in females, both in humans and other mammalian species. And what I found was that in gay men, this little region of cells is smaller than it is in heterosexual men. In fact, there was no difference in my data between this structure in gay men and the same structure in women. In both cases, it was relatively small. The brain theory is confirmed. As in sheep, but also in the gerbil, the ferret, and the rat, the brains of homosexuals and heterosexuals show differences. This region of the hypothalamus has been studied in experimental animals such as rats. And what's been found is that you can alter the size of this group of cells by manipulating the hormone levels that the animal is exposed to when it's a fetus. But you cannot do so if you manipulate those same hormone levels when the animal is adult. In other words, there's a sensitive period of development when the brain is first assembling itself when this region of the brain is, if you like, dependent on sex hormones for its development. And that's what seems to go forward differently in the brains of gay men and straight men during their fetal lives. This study, one of the first on the subject, was carried out on 40 brains. Critics shouted that these numbers were insufficient and that the brains studied were from AIDS victims, a disease that causes brain damage. Simon Levay is not the only one to have spotted these differences. The Institute for Brain Research at the University of Amsterdam in the Netherlands studied a different area of the hypothalamus and has made an important discovery. We studied many people in different uh, studies. Um, the collection of hypothalamus is about 2,000. Uh, what we found was a uh, very clear difference in the clock of the brain, the suprachiasmatic nucleus, that was twice as large in homosexual men as it was in heterosexual men. It contained uh, twice as many neurons. The clock of the brain was twice as big in uh, men that died from AIDS as in um, controls. And that appeared not to be due to AIDS because we had also material from heterosexuals that died from AIDS. It appeared to be uh, related to the homosexuality of uh, those men. Since then there are uh, many other brain areas uh, found that are also different and in my opinion we only know the tip of the iceberg. Many of the brains in this rather unusual bank are from homosexuals who hope that science will reveal the truth behind sexual orientation. It's very difficult to get uh, human brain samples for research purposes. And uh, this is based upon donation of uh, people. They donate a brain uh, for an autopsy with the permission to use the material for research purposes and a permission uh, to use the clinical data for research purposes. Uh, so we have a very good um, uh, uh, set of uh, human brains that are very, very well documented. The 
this collection has been used for many publications. And we also send out material all over the world. We have sent out material to 500 research groups in 25 countries. To draw any kind of conclusion from research that analyzes dead brain tissue would be highly limited. To understand what's going on, we really need to go inside a live brain. And that is precisely what Professor Ivanka Savik of the Karolinska Institute in Stockholm is doing. It's the same institute where Nobel Prizes are awarded. She studies the brain's response to stimuli. So this is the scanner room, and if you just please go in, you will... Ivanka Savik compares homosexual and heterosexual volunteers under an MRI and compares the results. I'm going to show you how to lay down the... Okay. To locate your brain, you will be able to hear everything I will say, and so you can communicate with me. You just squeeze this box and I will talk to you. The brain consists of two hemispheres, right and left. In the heterosexual group, in men, the two hemispheres are not symmetrical, whereas in women, they are. In the homosexual group, it's the opposite. In men, they are symmetrical, and in women, they are asymmetrical. Also did a study in homosexual subjects. Homosexual men had more of a symmetry, just like women, whereas Homosexual women were more asymmetric, just as in heterosexual men. Professor Savik also revealed significant differences in the perception of pheromones, chemicals that are produced by each and every one of us. They send out messages to the world around us. These messages play a role in sexual attraction between individuals. Recent discoveries have revealed that humans perceive pheromones through the nasal mucosa. We stimulated the brain by letting the subjects close the eyes and just passively smell without knowing what they were smelling and we presented the pheromones and odors under the nose. One of them is actually produced in human sweat, and the other one has been found in the urine of women. This image represents scans from two groups of subjects, homosexual men and heterosexual women. They smell different ordinary smells, which you owe the female pheromone on the male pheromone, and this, this shows that activation of the brain with the male pheromone in homosexual men and women is in the hypothalamus, which is our region of reproduction. Whereas when they smell the female pheromone or the ordinary orders, they just activate the ordinary uh, olfactory regions of the brain, which are completely different from this region. Where does this particular sensitivity to pheromones come from? Is it inherited or is it the result of education? In short, is it innate or acquired? It is very difficult to say from these studies that this would be a, an innate effect, a born effect. If we, if we did focus only on the anatomical study with this, it is more difficult to explain these asymmetries by learning or experience. Nerve activation can result from having learned it. Over time, we become sensitive to the odors of male perspiration. But can we change the asymmetry of the brain, which remains malleable after birth? The answer seems to be no. Many researchers therefore assume that neurological differences between heterosexuals and homosexuals could have a hormonal cause that occurs during the mother's pregnancy. Speaking of differences in the brain can be frightening. Such arguments recall bad memories during a particularly dark period of our history, where they were used to stigmatize certain populations. 
but it is in fact to these dark memories that we must return. The first hormonal theories on homosexuality began in East Berlin. The researcher Gunter Dorner found a significant increase in the number of homosexual boys born between 1942 and 1945, peaking in the last year when Berlin was heavily bombed. Gunter believed that many of these gay men were born from mothers terrified by the bombings. The mother's high level of stress is thought to have influenced the secretion of one of the male hormones, testosterone, in the embryo she is carrying. 